Hi all, welcome to part two of this lecture. So we're starting to use um, the second acronym writer to go through the poem Metaphors by Sylvia Plath. We ended last poem by talking, thinking about who's speaking in the poem Metaphors. And we realized, well, we don't know right away. That's what the whole poem about, is about. It's a riddle about who is speaking. Uh, so what, what is this metaphor, right? This goes to the structure. Is this, uh, is this a ballad? Is this a, a sonnet? Is this a, a, a sestina? What is this? Let's take a look. Well, how many lines does it have, right? A line is a word or row of word, or, uh, 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 is a, a word or row of words, sorry, that may or may not uh, form complete sentences, right? Usually ends with a punctuation mark, but not always. Um, so we have nine word, nine lines. Okay, well, that doesn't fit a sonnet. Sonnet's 14 lines, doesn't fit many of the forms I was just talking about, son, uh, sestinas, ballads. Also, just looking at it, you can see it's not a ballad. We'll, we'll talk about ballads another week, but uh, it doesn't seem to really have any specific form, right? There's one stanza. A stanza is a group of lines forming a, a unit similar to a paragraph, and they kind of operate the same as a paragraph that you would find in an essay. There's usually one idea kind of explored in a stanza and then move on to the next one. That's generally how poets use stanzas. Um, so it's not written in any specific form. Um, we don't see any rhyme structure that suggests anything like that. This is a, a free verse. We would call this free verse. So that doesn't give us any clues. Uh, well, I mean, it does give us clues. It tells us maybe something the author is doing, but it's important to think about what form the author is using because, you know, a sonnet has a very specific setup of ideas and answers. Uh, some types of poetry, we'll be looking at a lot of these narrative, dramatic poetry, lyric poetry, sonnets, free verse. We'll be looking at these throughout the semester. So I'm not going to um, dwell on these too much uh, and we'll be practicing a lot of these forms in our writing so then we go on to rhythm and rhyme right part of that writer um, uh, acronym what is the rhyme scheme um, again there's no rhyme scheme right the n words don't rhyme with each other right it's free verse when I read it aloud does it sound musical how does the punctuation work these are the kinds of questions you should ask yourself uh, and notice how she is using commas, I'm a rill of nine syllables, an elephant, a ponder's house, a melon strolling on two tendrils. Oh, red fruit, ivory, fine timber, right? So these commas seem to suggest uh, slight pauses. And sometimes, you know, in this fourth line, it gives it a bit of dramatic uh, power to the line. In, you know, these first three lines, it separates these different images that we're getting, right? And then we want to look for other things, alliteration, assonance, consonance, sibilance, and we'll get into these devices as we go through the semester. Uh, alliteration are when words, you know, like the jumping jumping jack, when two words start with the same letter, it creates a kind of rhythm. Assonance is uh, 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 the same. Um, when we have vowels, vowel sounds repeated, consonants is consonant sounds repeated, um, and we'll see these throughout the semester. Um, but you know, if we go through this, we don't have any strong patterns of that, um, of assonance, alliteration, consonant, sibilance. She's not really using uh, those to create a kind of rhythm to this poem. So uh, rhyme is, um, here's a definition, right? Repetition of the same stressed vowel sound and any succeeding sounds in two or more words, right? So words that rhyme. Internal rhyme occurs within the line of poetry. These are some of the terms we use to describe rhyme. End rhyme just occurs at the end of the line, right? And so that's what you're usually used to seeing. Roses are red, violets are blue, blah, blah, blah. And we would continue that rhyme structure at the end of the line. Um, and so a rhyme scheme is the pattern of end rhymes that may be de designated by assigning a different letter of the alphabet to each new rhyme. That sounds complicated. But what that means is when we're looking at rhyme scheme, right? So here's um, a famous Wordsworth poem. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd of a host of golden daffodils, but beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So it's got a really strong rhythm, right, created by those end rhymes, cloud, crowd, hills, daffodils, and then trees, breeze, right? And that's a stanza from this poem, and it creates this kind of like central uh, uh, idea for that stanza, and it's all very connected, and it's all very logical, and holds together because of that rhyme structure, right? And how we how we uh, describe that rhyme structure when we're looking at poetry 
is by assigning letters to those different end rhymes, right? It just helps us discuss rhyme structure quickly, right? So this poem has an A, B, A, B, C, C rhyme structure, right? We can compare that to, uh, just going back here, hope this doesn't take forever, right? There's no rhyme structure, so it'd just be A, B, C, D if we were to write out the letters, but that's unnecessary if there's no rhyme structure, right? So I'll get through this again, right? So we use the letters to denote uh, rhyme structure, rhyme scheme, rhythm and meter. So rhythm is the pattern of sound created by the arrangement of stressed and unstressed syllables in a line. You might remember your Shakespeare is all iambic pentameter. So da do da do da do right? That kind of uh, rising beat every foot of, of a poem or a written uh, line of his, uh, in his, in most of his plays, right? A lot of his characters are talking iambic pentameter. Uh, the meter is the regular pattern of stressed uh, and unstressed syllables, right? Um, do, 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 do. And that's what we're getting into with the iambic pentameter, right? The, the meter and the rhythm. So uh, let's skip over that. Let's move on to, uh, uh, well, talking about um, uh, this poem again, there's no set rhythm to it, right? This, there's, it's, not, it's not written in iambic pentameter or any kind of recognizable traditional uh, uh, rhythm, just to, or meter to, um, to, to let us know. So let's move on to imagery, right? Um, so when you're looking at imagery in a poem, you should really go through and circle all the imagery, the personification, the similes, the metaphors. These are terms we'll look at uh, soon in the course. So let's look at this one. I'm a riddle of nine syllables. Okay, we're told that at the beginning, right? And you know, this beginning is a, a metaphor in itself. The, the, the speaker is not literally a riddle, as we'll see, right? But she is describing herself in that way to suggest that there's a, a meaning beneath, uh, you know, some of the imagery, right? She's an elephant, a ponderous house, a melon strolling on two tendrils. So there we get three images. We get more images, red fruit, ivory, fine timber, loaf big with this yeasty rising, money from a pat, fat purse, a means, a stage, a cow and calf, a bag of green apples, and then this end metaphor, she's boarded this train, there's no getting off, right? So this poem, as the title would suggest, Metaphors, is a series of metaphors, a series of images that is held, supposed to help us unpack uh, what the I is that's speaking in this poem. So we're looking for patterns when we're looking at the imagery, right? So what do these things have in common? Elephant, ponderous, house, a, a melon strolling on two tendrils. Well, they're all big round things. That's, I mean, a house isn't necessarily round, but an elephant and a melon are big things. A ponderous house, ponderous in this sense, tends to su suggest big, right? And then this fourth line I find really interesting in this poem because it, it, it points back to these images here, right? Red fruit is a melon. Ivory comes from elephant, fine timber, the house, right? So these images are just repeating these images. And she's, you know, the O suggests a kind of ode, right? Oh, red fruit, fine, or ivory, fine timbers, right? It's like the, you know, the, the scene in Hamlet. Oh, Yorick, poor Yorick, I knew him well, that kind of uh, ode to something. So she seems to be celebrating these images in this fourth line. The other, you know, images, so a big loaf that's rising seems similar to elephant, melon, money, new, new minted in this fat purse, right? Again, something that's big, perhaps round, um, eating a bag of green apples. That's that's when it's a little more specialized. You have to look into the, the wives' tale connected with uh, a bag of green apples. The board of the train is still getting off, which seems to be a break in the imagery from the rest. Most of the rest of the imagery is fairly positive. Maybe I'm a means, a stage, a cow and calf is not super positive, right? We get this more positive stuff in the beginning that seems to turn a bit more ominous or mm, dark towards the end. And that gets us into tone, right? What is the attitudes, at, the poet's attitude towards the subject, right? It seems the, the author is celebrating something in the beginning, but it seems to get darker as it goes on. Uh, and this, you know, you could make different arguments about how the author feels about the, the subject of this poem um, and look at the pattern and think about, you know, why is she taking on this journey from positive to uh, perhaps more negative? And um, just a word about connotation and denotation. So connotation, 
is the emotional imaginative association surrounding a word versus denotation, which is the strict diction dictionary definition of a word, right? So oftentimes we'll use words that have more meanings than just what is strictly implied by the dictionary definition. These are cultural associations that become, um, the, the, the build up around words. So for example, uh, you may live in a house, but we live in a home. Home and house mean the same thing, kind of, but home has very different meanings, very different connotations than house. Uh, so again, back to our metaphor. Let's try to wrap this up. We're running along. So the effect of this poem, uh, you should read this poem a couple times. Try to figure out what the pattern is between the images. Try to think about what the effect is. Do you like this poem? Does it um, does it just confuse you? Does it make you laugh? Uh, if you think you know what the what the riddle is, how do you think the author feels about this? What what the um, about the subject of the poem. I don't want to give it away because I kind of want to leave this open for you. Uh, we can address this a bit later. I want you to think about it and try to add it up on your own and then think about uh, what the author is saying about that. Because there's multiple ways to read it. Is the author being facetious and, and kind of lighthearted? Or is the author offering something darker for us to think about? Right? Once you think about your own, um, the effect that a, a poem has on you, you can start thinking about your own response. Right? What is the emotional response, intellectual response you have while reading a poem? How would you respond to it? Because again, as I mentioned in the beginning, poetry is, is different than, than prose because it's meant to be an experience, right? When you read a poem, you're meant to react to it and, and, and have an emotional response, an intellectual response to the ideas and the, the connections that the author is making or the poet's making, okay? So again, that's my acronym I like to use. And the reason I like this acronym, again, is because it gets you to slow down and go through step by step. Okay, here's what I'm seeing on the page, and that's how it helps you add things up. It can help you, you know, with poems like that, which can be dense and are packed with imagery. And again, that poem is specifically a riddle, right? Something for you to figure out, which is, you know, part of the reason I, I like it so much. But, it, you know, this acronym can also help us with different kinds of poetry, right? I mean, concrete poetry like this, which is uh, building on the power of the image, right? What do you do with this? If, you, if you're uh, unfamiliar with B, BP Nichols' work um, and you just, you know, someone just throws it in your lap, well, you can use the writer acronym to break this apart, right? Take a look at what's happening. Uh, and really think through what's what's making up this this poem, right? Uh, as well for something like uh, one of my other favorite poems, Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll, which you know involves the use of nonsense words to um, tell this story, uh, and it, it challenges some of our ways of reading poetry as well, and our attribute the way we attribute meaning to things to metaphors. Anyway, so that's just a, a brief intro to how I think about poetry, how I read poetry. We're going to dive into a lot of these ideas throughout the semester, so don't worry if uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions. Okay, that's about it. Thank you very much. Have a good uh, semester.